Do Teens Read Seriously Anymore? by David Denby, published in The New Yorker, February 23, 2016. Among teenagers in recent years, reading anything serious has become a chore, like doing the laundry or preparing a meal for a kid brother. A common sight in malls, in pizza parlors, in Starbucks, and wherever else American teens hang out, three or four kids, hooded, gather around a table, leaning over like monks or druids, their eyes fastened to the smartphones held in front of them. The phones, converging at the center of the table, come close to touching. The teens are making a communion of a sort. Looking at them, you can envy their happiness. You can always also find yourself wishing them immersed in a different kind of happiness, in a superb book or a series of books, in the reading obsession itself. You should probably keep on wishing. It's very likely that teenagers, attached to screens of one sort or another, read more words than they ever have in the past. But they often read scraps, excerpts, articles, parts of articles, messages, pieces of information from everywhere and from nowhere. It's likely that they are reading fewer books. Yes, millions of kids have read Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, The Hunger Games, and other fantasy and dystopian fictions. Also, vampire romance, graphic novels, some very good, young adult novels, ditto, and convulsively exciting street lit. Yet what happens as they move toward adolescence? When they become 12 or 13, kids often stop reading seriously. The boys veer off into sports or computer games, the girls into friendship in all its retching mystery and satisfaction of favor and exclusion. Much of their social life, for boys as well as girls, is now conducted on smartphones, where teenagers don't have to confront one another. The Terror of Eye Contact! Sherry Turkle, in her recent book, Reclaiming Conversation, has written about the loss of self that this avoidance creates, and also the peculiar boredom paradoxically produced by the act of constantly fleeing boredom. If kids are avoiding eye contact, they are avoiding books even more. Work by the Pew Research Center and other outfits have confirmed the testimony of teachers and parents and the evidence of one's eyes. Few late teenagers are reading many books. A recent summary of studies cited by Common Sense Media indicates that American teenagers are less likely to read for fun at 17 than at 13. The category of reading for fun is itself a little depressing, since it divides reading into duty for school and gratification, sitting on a beach towel, as if the two were necessarily opposed. My own observations, after spending a lot of time talking to teenagers in recent years, Reading anything serious has become a chore, like doing the laundry or prepping a meal for a kid brother. Or, if it's not a chore, it's just an activity, like swimming or shopping. An activity like any other. It's not something that runs through the rest of their lives. In some, reading has lost its privileged status. Few kids are ashamed that they're not doing it much. The notion that you should always have a book going, that notion which all real readers share, doesn't flour flourish in many kids. Often, they look at you blankly when you ask them what they are reading on their own. Of course, these kids are very busy. School, homework, sports, jobs, clothes, parents, brothers, sisters, half-brothers, half-sisters, friendships, love affairs, hanging out, music, and most of all, screens. TV, internet, games, texting, Instagramming. Compared with all of that, reading a book's a weak, petulant claimant on their time. Reading frustrates their smartphone sense of being everywhere at once. Suddenly, they are stuck on that page, anchored, moored, and many are glum about it. Being unconnected makes them anxious and even angry. Books smell like old people, I heard a student say in New Haven. Yes, I know, this is not a new story. We have known it since the iPhone was introduced in 2007. Yet, teenagers or teenage time on screens, as Turkle has documented, has recently increased to the point where it takes over many young lives altogether. Digital culture has enveloped us more quickly and more thoroughly than most of us had imagined. But what can be done, done about it? Many adults, overwhelmed by a cha changed reality, shrug off the problem. You don't want to become a crank. After all, reading technologies have changed in the past. Television altered consciousness and social patterns 60 years ago, and kids survived and became adults. Literature will survive too, somehow. Or so we would like to think. I'm not so sure. The personal, personal gratification provided by constant feedback doesn't wither as one gets older. Some of this indifference may be caused by rueful self-acknowledgement on the part of adults. Many of us are looking at screens all the time, too. Even the book lovers carrying some tome on an airplane or listening to an audiobook in their car turn on their phones as soon as they can. 
Was it better once? I know perfectly well that there was never a golden age of teen reading. No more than a minority read on their own J.D. Salinger or Joseph Heller or Charlotte Bronte 50 years ago, or Kurt Vonnegut or Ray Bradbury or Allen Ginsberg 40 years ago, or science and history. Yet now that minority has grown even smaller, and defensive too. The celebrated nerds among kids are mostly techies. Making the case that serious reading is one of life's great boons, that screenbound kids are in danger of missing something tremendous, has become awkward, square-headed, emotionally difficult. The pleas for beauty and moral complexity may sound merely plaintive. Few of us are as fierce as the gentle Keats. Novelists, poets, essayists, and university humanists emerging from their proud corners find it hard to talk of character, judgment, perceptiveness, wit, empathy, and other such virtues encouraged by serious reading. They're not salesmen, and they don't want to sound like Win William Bennett. Such things, they believe, should be self-evident. Earlier ages, the Greeks, the Victorians, etc., were convinced of the improving value of literature, but in the 20th century, the sophisticated position, Wilde, Nabokov, Updike, Vidal, was always that literature improves nothing, does nothing. It creates only delight. Among famous critics and scholars, Harold Bloom, in book after book, has argued for reading as the way to have developed self, but my guess is that he speaks to those who don't need convincing. If the rest of us give up on book reading without a fight, we will, re will we regret it, even be ashamed as the culture hollows out? I will put it tendentiously. Could a country that has widely read Huckleberry Finn have taken Donald J. Trump seriously for a second? Twain's readers will remember the king and the duke. They know what a bullying con artist sounds like. Lifetime readers know that reading literature can be transformative, but they can't prove it. If they tried, they would have to buck the metric prejudice, the American notion that assertions unsupported with statistics are virtually meaningless. What they know about literature and its effects is literally and spiritually immeasurable. They would have to buck common marketplace wisdom, too. In an economy demanding skill sets, defined narrowly as technical and business skills, that deep reading stuff won't get you anywhere. The Times reported that at least 15 state governments were offering some type of bonus or premium for high-demand STEM degrees. All the people in the world who want to study French literature can do so, Matt Bevan, the governor of Kentucky, said. They're just not going to be subsidized by the taxpayers like engineers will be, for example. Governor Bevan, as it turns out, graduated from Washington and Lee with a bachelor's degree in Japanese and East Asian studies. So much for the crippling effects of the humanities. But this STEM panic... Maybe nonsense. Business leaders have repeatedly said they want to hire people who can think and judge, follow complicated instructions, understand fellow workers, stand up and talk in a meeting. I know that reading literature, history, science, and the rest of the liberal arts canon helps produce three-dimensional human beings, but how is a taste for such reading created in the first place? Infants held in their parents' arms, told stories, and will and read to will not remember the images or the words, but they will likely remember the warmth and comfort associated with books and conversation, especially when the experience is repeated hundreds of times. The luckiest of children fall out of parents' arms into preschool. In the good ones, books are read aloud, valued, expounded, held up for kids to enjoy. The rest of American children arrive at school in kindergarten and are then, for 13 years, either nurtured or betrayed by teachers. Teachers are the most maligned and ignor ignored professionals in America, in American life. In the humanities, the good ones are as central to our emotional and moral life as priests, ministers, rabbis, and imams. The good ones are not sheepish or silent in deference of literature and history and the rest. They can't be. The children's lives are right before them. In high school English, if the teachers are shrewd and willing to take a few risks, they will try to reach the students where they live emotionally. They will engage, for instance, with naive existential questions, what do I live for, and also adolescent fascination with dark moods and the fear of being engulfed by adult society. Shakespeare, Mary Shelley, Poe, Hawthorne, Twain, Stevenson, Orwell, Vonnegut, and many others wrote about such things. And if teachers can make books important to kids and forge the necessary link to pleasure and need, those kids may turn off the screens, at least for a few vital hours.